Welcome to the first installment of the Great Astronomers of the Past series. My name is Dr. Joe Buchanan. I'm an amateur astronomer, and I also love history. So I decided to combine these two passions and share with you some of the stories of the men and women whom you may never have heard of, but nevertheless have made a great impact on our understanding of the universe. Today I want to focus on James Keeler. In her book, The Day We Found the Universe, Marsha Bartusiak writes, Though now reduced to a minor figure in many histories of astronomy, Keeler was actually a forerunner in the birth of modern cosmology, a crucial player in helping to launch a new, the new field. The man who could manipulate a spectroscope like no other, he pioneered uses for the new instrument at a time when astronomers were just beginning to apply the method of physics in their work. Born in LaSalle, Illinois, James Keeler spent most of his childhood in Mayport, Florida. His father was a paymaster in the U.S. Navy during the Civil War, and his mother was the daughter of the former governor of Connecticut. He became interested in astronomy after witnessing the solar eclipse in 1869 when he was just 11 years old. This eclipse was an important milestone in American astronomy and marks the beginning of a national obsession with all things astronomical. Thanks to a benefactor named Charles Rockwell, Keeler was able to enroll at Johns Hopkins University as a 20-year-old freshman. In July of 1878, he took part in an expedition to Central City, Colorado to observe a solar eclipse. This eclipse was an important moment in Keeler's life, but it also represented a major moment for astronomy in general. For the first time, many of the leading astronomers of the day were able to observe the eclipse from the heights of the Rocky Mountains. This experience led to a change in where observatories were built. Prior to 1878, most observatories were built near the towns and university campuses simply for the sake of convenience. But after 1878, however, more and more observatories were built on the higher elevations. He graduated with his BA degree in 1881 and traveled to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to begin working with Samuel P. Langley at the Allegheny Observatory. The Allegheny was the brainchild of Professor Lewis Bradley and a group of citizens who formed the Allegheny Telescope Association in February 1859. Together, they raised enough money to purchase a 13-inch refracting telescope from Henry Fitz of New York. First light for the new tele telescope was November 27, 1861, and at first it was primarily reserved for the entertainment and interest of the group members. By 1867, however, public interest in the telescope waned, and the group decided to donate the telescope and observatory building to the Western University of Pennsylvania, later known as the University of Pittsburgh. With this change, the observatory received a new scientific direction. To put it in perspective, the Allegheny Observatory, the building of the observatory, was part of a increased interest in astronomy that was sweeping across America for a couple of decades. It was really spurred on by two major events. The first was in 1833 when the Leonid meteor shower unleashed a torrent of somewhere between 50,000 and 150,000 meteors per hour. It was so intense that Dr. Dennison Almasted of Yale University decided to do what we might call today the first example of citizen science. He sent out an ad into newspapers across the country asking for people to send in their accounts. He received thousands and thousands of letters explaining to him what people had seen during that meteor shower. He published those results in the 1834 edition of the American Journal of Science and Arts. Ten years later, in 1843, on February 5th, a long-period comet that has now gone down in history as simply being known as the Great Comet of 1843 appeared in the night sky. It had an extremely long tail that was approximately two astronomical lengths in, um, in distance. 
Olmsted pronounced that this comet was the most remarkable in its appearance of all that had been seen in modern times. As a result of these two events and a general desire for America to become more respectable among the nations for its scientific endeavors, there was a remarkable new push to build observatories around the country. And in fact, wealthy patrons around the, the nation began to pour money into the construction of telescopes in places like like Cincinnati, Ohio, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and on college campuses across the continent. One of these new observatories was built by a wealthy businessman named James Lick on the summit of Mount Hamilton near San Jose, California. For some time, Lick had been searching for a way to make a meaningful mark in the world and establish a lasting legacy after he died. After exploring numerous options, he became captivated by an astro amateur astronomer named George Madeira, who had shared with him several of the latest discoveries being made in the field. At the end of that conversation, Madeira said to Lick, if I had your wealth, Mr. Lick, I would construct the largest telescope possible to construct. After further encouragement from the head of the National Academy of Sciences and a Harvard naturalist, Lick decided to give $1 million to the building of a state-of-the-art observatory. Bartusiak com comments that no observatory had ever been established in such a remote and elevated locale. In that decisive shift, astronomy would change in a remarkable way, whisking the field away from its previous urban settings. While the Lick Observatory was being constructed, James Keeler spent a year doing graduate work in Germany. It was in Germany that he learned the skills necessary to become an expert in spectral analysis. The fact that visible light traveling through a prism could be separated into its constituent wavelengths was first discovered in 1666 by Sir Isaac Newton. Using a spectroscope, astronomers in the 19th century discovered that by examining the light waves emitted by a celestial object, they could determine its composition. In early 1886, James Keeler was appointed as an assistant to the Lick trustees and arrived at Mount Hamilton on April 25, 1886, where he helped to install the various instruments in the observatory and was placed in charge of the spectroscopic work. The massive 36-inch refractor at Lick saw its first light on January 3, 1888. But unfortunately, an error in the length of the tube meant that the light could not be brought into focus. The problem was quickly identified and six inches of the tube were removed. Finally, on January 7, 1888, the largest refracting telescope that had been built up to that time was brought into focus on Rigel. Later that same evening, the group observed the Orion Nebula and then Saturn. Over the next three weeks, James Keeler continued making detailed observations of the planets and, of a, and a solar eclipse, producing exquisitely detailed drawings and honing his skills with the spectroscope. It was with a spectroscope, largely of his design, that he observed the spectra of Gamma Cassiopeia, Beta Lyra, and the Orion Nebula, and 13 other planetary nebula. In 1891, Keeler shocked the astronomy world by resigning at Lick to take over the position of director of the Allegheny Observatory. Now, this was surprising for a couple of reasons. First of all, the location of the Allegheny Observatory had a lot to be desired. Located very close to the industrial center of Pittsburgh, it just lacked the number of clear nights that he would have had at Lick. Second of all, going from the 36-inch reflector at Lick back to the 13-inch refractor at Allegheny seemed to be a great step backwards when it came to equipment. And yet he made the best out of it. In 1903, Charles Hastings wrote a biographical sketch of Keeler's life and was presented it to the National Academy of Sciences. And I want to read to you what he wrote. He said, the Allegheny Observatory has perhaps the poorest location of any observatory in this country for spectroscopic work. But in spite of this disadvantage, Keeler's investigations continued to promote the splendid reputation established for the observatory 
by his predecessor. So overall, Keeler made the best out of a less than ideal situation. Upon arriving at Pittsburgh, Keeler set out to do a couple of things. First of all, he needed to make several adjustments to the equipment, and then he needed to make some adjustments to the techniques that he was using in his spectroscopic work. Once those were completed, he began to set out on taking an analysis of measuring the rotation of the major planets and the sun. On one such analysis taken on April 9, 1895, he discovered that Saturn's rings were made up of particles and that they were not a series of rigid planes as had been suggested by Christian Huygens in the 1650s. This discovery demonstrated that the predictions made by James Clerk Maxwell were actually correct. While James Keeler was busy with his spectroscopy work at Pittsburgh, Edward Holden, the director of the Lick Observatory, began work to bring the historic Crosley Reflector to Mount Hamilton. The Crosley Reflector was built in 1879 by the amateur astronomer Andrew A. Common in Great Britain. Rather than using a metal mirror, Common used a glass mirror, which proved far superior for photographic work. In 1884, the Royal Astronomical Society awarded Common a gold medal for a photograph of the Orion Nebula taken using the Crosley just a year before. With plans to build an even larger reflector, Common agreed to sell the telescope to Edward Crosley in 1885, who moved the telescope to Yorkshire. After a few years of getting frustrated due to the poor astronomical conditions of the English countryside, Crosley agreed to sell the telescope to Holden and the Lick Observatory. In 1895, the Crosley crossed the Atlantic and arrived at Mount Hamilton. The initial response by astronomers were less than exciting. One staffer saying it was a pile of junk. Not long after, Edward Holden was forced to resign and James Keeler was selected as his replacement. After James Keeler was appointed director of the Lick Observatory in 1898, his personal qualities and extraordinary personality can be demonstrated by the response of the people of Pittsburgh to the news that he was leaving. Marsha Bartusiak notes that upon hearing the news that he might be leaving, the Allegheny Observatory supporters made a last minute effort to raise money and build a new edifice and to complete the 30 inch refractor that he'd been wanting to build. There were even poems written about him and published in the local newspaper begging him to stay. But in spite of all their efforts, James Keeler left Pittsburgh for California, arriving on June 1, 1898 to begin his new duties. Within a month of arriving at Lick, Keeler set out to work and completed his first paper on spectral analysis of a star using the 36-inch refractor. But then he made a momentous but seemingly unlikely decision to concentrate his efforts on getting the historic but lately maligned Crosley uh, telescope up and working. On its face, this decision seemed strange. The Crosley was a smaller instrument than the main 36-inch refractor, and it was notoriously challenging to work with. But Keeler had become interested in reflecting telescopes while in Pittsburgh, and was aware that these types of telescopes had an advantage for the type of work he wanted to do. The thick lenses in refractors reduced the amount of light that could pass through his spectroscope, but the mirrors on reflectors did not have this problem. By using a reflector, Keeler could believe he could capture the spectra of objects too dim for refractors. In addition, he had also seen the incredible images that were being taken with reflectors in Europe during a trip to Scotland. By taking images, he knew that astronomers could do much better analysis and comparison, so he worked diligently on getting the Crosley reflector up and running. The images that he began taking shocked the astronomical world. His image of the Pleiades was the first to show the characteristic filaments and clouds of gas that we are so familiar with today. His image of the Great Orion Nebula showed details that had never been seen before, and it was featured on the cover of the publication of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. 
but his greatest contributions to astronomy came when he began to turn his attention towards what were known then as spiral nebulae. Today, we know that spiral nebulae are distant galaxies, but in the late 19th and early 20th century, there was a great debate ex about exactly what these strange objects could be. Bartusiak notes that from the days of Ptolemy, astronomers talked about certain stars in the sky that appeared cloudy to the eyes. The most famous of these was the strange oval of light that the Persian astronomer al-Sufi referred to as the little cloud in the constellation Andromeda. In 1755, Immanuel Kant speculated that there might be external galaxies or island universes, as he called them, beyond the Milky Way. His theory was built primarily on speculation, but after the invention of the telescope, more and more of these strange smudges of light were discovered. In 1781, Charles Messier published his catalog of location of over a hundred of these strange objects, but he was only interested in the fact that they were not comets, therefore they didn't merit much of his attention. But beginning in 1782, William Herschel began a 20-year systematic survey of the night sky, looking at to add to Messier's catalog of nebulae. During this project, he discovered over 2,400 objects that he labeled as nebula, forming the basis of what be la would be later known as the New General Catalog, or NGC Catalog. He noted the fact that whenever he would find one of these strange nebulae, there would usually be more in the vicinity. This is something that Keeler would also notice and take great advantage of. During the 1840s, William Parson, the third Lord of Ross, using his massive 72-inch reflector named Leviathan, sketched the spiral structure of Messier 51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, energizing speculation that it might be a separate star system from the Milky Way. This theory became known as the Island Universe Theory, and it would divide astronomy until the mid-1920s when Edwin Hubble would settle the matter once and for all. But in the middle 1800s, the jury was still out, and the evidence still did not clearly reveal the truth. Those who believed that spirals were part of the Milky Way galaxy were encouraged by the work of William Huggins, an amateur astronomer in England who became fascinated with the new techniques of spectroscopy, which was just starting to take hold. In 1863, he published his first results demonstrating that distant stars are composed of the same elements as the sun. Then in 1864, he turned his attention from stars to nebulae, proving that nebula are made of, up of incandescent gas rather than aggregations of stars. Since most astronomers of the day did not make any great distinction between what we know as galaxies and nebula, many astronomers believe the case was closed. In fact, by 1890, Agnes Clerk could confidently state in her book, The System of the Stars, that the question whether nebulae are external galaxies hardly any longer needs discussion. It has been answered by the process of discovery. No competent thinker with the whole of the available evidence before him can now, it is safe to say, maintain any single nebula to be a star system coordinate rank with, coordinate in rank with the Milky Way. But in 1899, using the Crosley reflector, James Keeler would lay the foundations that would eventually call this theory into question. On April 4th of that year, he took an image of Messier 81 that revealed its spiral structure. Keeler ended up discarding that image due to some star trailing, but continued his work on spirals. The very next month, he took the most detailed image of Messier 51 that had yet been captured. Even more surprising than the fine details of the spiral ring arms, however, Keeler noticed that there were seven more nebula located in the picture. Later that summer, he took a picture of NGC 6946, today better known as the Fireworks Galaxy, and saw that it too was a spiral, but again to his surprise, he found other spirals in the background of the image. 
In the fall, he imaged NGC 891 and found 31 new spirals in that image. In photograph over after photograph, he found that spirals were rarely alone in the night sky. As he took more and more images, he was surprised to discover more and more spirals each time, finding that they were not alone. Rather than being a rather rare occurrence, James Keeler now estimated that the true number of spirals in the night sky might exceed 120,000. Prior to his work, astronomers had identified around 9,000 nebula in the night sky, but only 75 of them had been spirals. Keeler's discoveries were causing astronomers to rethink their entire understanding of the cosmos. Sadly, James Keeler died suddenly on August 12, 1900 of lung cancer. Marsha Bartusiak ponders the question of what might have happened had he lived long enough to continue his work. And we can easily see, given his interest in what he was discovering with spirals and the work with the spectroscope, it's not hard to conclude that had he continued his work, he may well have made the discoveries that later were attributed to Hubble and to others. Nevertheless, James Keeler's work made a major impact on astronomy. When we think about what Keeler contributed in his short career, we find first of all that he pioneered the use of the spectroscope. He proved James Clark Maxwell's theory that Saturn's rings were made up of small bodies. He demonstrated that spiral nebulae numbered in the tens of thousands, and that began to prompt men like Harlow Shapley and others to continue studying these rather interesting objects in the night sky. And he also helped to found the Astrophysical Journal with George Ellerly Hale. James Keeler is not a well-known astronomer, but someone that we all grow a great deal of gratitude towards.